Today we're going to cover the reign of King Gustav Vasa. This video is the second part in a two part series. If you haven't watched part 1 yet, make sure you do that before you keep watching. The year is 1523, the king of Denmark has been defeated and Sweden has officially severed all ties to the Kalmar Union in favor of becoming an independent country with Gustav Vasa as its king. Despite his triumph, the new king found himself in a tough situation. The war with Denmark had left Sweden poor and heavily indebted to Lubeck. In order to get the kingdom back on its feet, the state was in a desperate need for more resources. Luckily for King Gustav, an enticing opportunity to get the resources needed soon appeared. Down on the continent, new winds were blowing. The Protestant Reformation, initially started by Martin Luther in the 1510s, had spread throughout Central Europe and led many lords to break their ties with the papacy. This new religion soon came to Sweden through German traders and presented a tempting opportunity to the crown. A central idea of the reformation was that the property of the church belonged to the people, who in turn were represented by the king. Capitalizing on this idea, the crown gradually started to seize the church properties and used it to pay back the interest, as well as strengthen the crown's power. The actions were of course not without opposition, and in order to legitimize the seizure of church properties, Gustav held what in Sweden is called a riksdag, roughly translated to parliament, in the city of Västerås in 1527. The assembly was attended by many representatives from the realm's four estates, who all came to discuss solutions to the kingdom's pressed situation. The representatives of the church were of course negative to the crown's proposal to seize its lands, but by compromising with the nobility, the burghers and the peasants, King Gustav managed to get his proposal accepted and thus steamrolled the clerical opposition. As a result, the Catholic Church in Sweden lost all of its properties and was transformed into the National Church of Sweden with Gustav Vasa as its head. This development meant that Sweden officially broke with the Catholic Church, though it didn't necessarily mean that Sweden became Protestant. Many Catholic ideas and practices remained throughout the century, until the Church of Sweden officially declared the land to be Protestant in 1593. Despite the riches from the church property, however, it was not enough to solve the government's financial problems. The crown needed more money, and the only way to get it was to introduce new taxes. As probably been made clear by now, is raising taxes a big no-no to the Swedish peasantry, and civil unrest soon broke out in many places in the land, even among the people in Dalarna, who just a few years prior had rallied behind King Gustav. In order to keep the kingdom together, the insurgencies needed to be dealt with, even if it meant sending out an army to stamp out the civil unrest by force if needed. Unlike his predecessor though, King Gustav proved himself to be quite efficient in handling the insurgencies. Instead of defeating the rebels on the battlefield, he reached out to the peasants in order to try to come to a compromise he could accept. At the same time, he also used agents to spread propaganda to nearby regions to avoid a local rebellion from spreading beyond its origin point. To achieve this, the king took advantage of the printing press, a relatively recent invention which allowed the crown to spread thousands of pamphlets that delegitimized and black painted his opposition. The strategy proved to be efficient and allowed the king to keep many rebellions small enough that they either would be easily crushed by the crown's forces or be forced to surrender due to the rebels finding themselves in an unwinnable situation 
One rebellion, however, would become too much for the crown's propaganda machine to handle. In the region of Småland, the peasantry were angry with the new taxes, as well as the increased governmental control that came with it. In the Middle Ages, the people of Småland, like most other regions, had for the most part governed themselves, while paying taxes to the church and the crown. During the reign of Gustav Vasa, this would come to change, as the fingers of the state began to dig deep into the common folk's daily life, making changes to old religious practices, as well as introducing new regulations like the prohibition against hunting large animals, and the prohibition against cutting down oak trees that the state could use to build warships. Needless to say, many peasants in Småland wanted none of this, and in the summer of 1542, a rebellion broke out, led by a farmer named Nils Dacke. King Gustav applied his usual strategy of spreading information that black painted the rebels to villages all over the region. The attempt to delegitimize the rebels would be in vain, for Dacke and his supporters knew the fastest way to travel in Småland and could spread their message of rebellion before the king's propaganda had the time to arrive. Unable to contain the uprising, the crown raised an army of Swedish knights and German mercenaries to crush the rebellion by force. The peasantry in Småland, however, knew how to fight back. Armed with crossbows and a superior knowledge of the region, the rebels avoided open battle in favor of conducting guerrilla tactics in the forest. The rebellion initially went well, until Nils Dacke got injured by a musket shot in 1543 and became unable to lead the rebel army. Without their leader, the rebellion became disorganized, and eventually were forced to accept defeat to the government in Stockholm. Nils Dacke's rebellion of 1542 would come to be one of the final peasant rebellions in Swedish history, as well as a historical dividing line, for afterwards the crown's control of Småland, as well as other regions, accelerated. The regulations grew in number, and was accompanied by a growing number of royal administrators that started to replace traditional ways in which people had governed themselves. An example of the increased governmental control was when it came to law and order, an area which in the Middle Ages had been handled by local village councils, that during Gustav Vasa's reign were replaced by royal bailiffs. In one sense, this development robbed the peasantry of their right to rule themselves, but at the same time it also strengthened the communication between the peasantry and the state, since the peasants now had local governmental representatives whom they could voice their complaints of the king's policy to. This in turn gave the crown more effective ways to communicate with the peasantry, as well as a better sense of what reforms the state could implement, and what reforms the peasants would not put up with. The integration of regional and the governmental administration was accompanied by transformation and expansion of the Swedish government itself. From originally having been a council of members of the high nobility, with the king as its elected leader, the council expanded into different departments that had their own responsibilities. Examples of such departments were the war council, responsible for administrating the kingdom's army and navy, the chamber council, responsible for administrating the kingdom's finances, and the secretary council, responsible for running communication between the different departments, as well as preparing errands for the king to take a decision on. One final transformation of the Swedish government was regarding the role of the king. Following the Dacke rebellion, King Gustav held the new Riksdag in 1544, during which he proposed that the office of the king should be inherited instead of appointed by a majority vote among the high nobility, a proposal that was accepted by the representatives. 
with the resources from the confiscated church properties, as well as the new taxes, the state finances began to recover, and King Gustav could start to pay back some of Sweden's loans to Lübeck. In addition, did the government also begin to build a new standing army, as well as a new sailing fleet that would be able to compete in the Baltic Sea. Shortly after the Armada was finished, Sweden quickly got the opportunity to use it. In the middle of the 16th century, the Hanseatic League was engaged in a war with Denmark regarding the succession of the Danish crown. Seizing on the opportunity to get rid of the debts to Lübeck, the leader of the league, Sweden allied with Denmark and managed to destroy the Hanseatic navy. Through the victory, Gustav forced Lübeck to annul Sweden's debts to the Hanseatic league. In addition, he also revoked all of the Hanseatic league's trading privileges in the Swedish ports, marking the end of the league's century-long influence in northern Europe. In the summer of 1560, the now old king arrived in Stockholm to partake in his last public appearance. A riksdag was held in the capital with representatives from all across the land partaking. When the event was over, King Gustav became sick and bedridden, and in the autumn the same year he confessed his sins and confirmed his Christian faith before passing away at the age of 64. By the end of his 37 year long reign, King Gustav had transformed Sweden down to its core. From having been a mostly decentralized semi-feudal kingdom ruled by the King of Denmark in 1520, Sweden was now a centralized state with stable finances and a military force able to compete with Sweden's neighbors in Northern Europe. In this sense, Gustav Vasa is one of the most important rulers in Swedish history. He is also, however, one of the more controversial ones. On one hand, he led a rebellion that liberated Sweden from Denmark, as well as modernized the country and laid the foundation for the rise of the Swedish Empire a century later. On the other hand, he was a harsh ruler who didn't hesitate to break his promises and rid himself of people he deemed to be potentially dangerous. An example of this is his treatment of the people leading the rebellions during his reign. As mentioned earlier, did several of the rebel leaders decide to surrender when they realized that their endeavor was doomed to fail? In most, if not all of these instances, Gustav gave them false promises of pardon, and when meeting up with the king's representatives, they were either killed on the spot, or arrested and executed in Stockholm. In this sense, Gustav was not a much better king than his predecessor, King Christian. The ruthlessness is well reflected in how the king was described in private correspondence by both his enemies as well as his supporters. His sweeping reforms also removed many of the peasantry's old freedoms and ways to govern themselves. At the same time did his reign have several positive aspects. By the mid 16th century, the state's finances had been stabilized, and Sweden now had both an army and a navy strong enough to enable the kingdom to compete against its Nordic neighbors. Gustav's practice of calling Riksdag had also created a new dynamic between the king and his subjects. Instead of the peasantry being expected to rise up in rebellion against unpopular laws, they were instead expected to present their complaints to the government's representatives, or in the parliament. Gustav Vasa's government also took interest in agriculture and encouraged peasants to cultivate new soil, since it increased the state's tax revenue, leading the population to grow between 20 and 30 percent during the course of the century. Taken together, I think the best word to characterize Gustav Vasa as a king is Machiavellian. And though he likely never read Machiavelli's book The Prince, 
he certainly ruled in accordance with the rules it laid out. He was brutal, yet not sadistic, and he put a lot of effort into influencing how the common folk perceived both himself and his enemies. He was also definitely not stupid, which is reflected in how he conducted foreign policy. With the exception of the short war against Lubeck and a border dispute with Russia, King Gustav was careful when handling the relationship with Sweden's neighbors and avoided dragging the country into costly wars that would have made it impossible to fix the state's finances. Given the circumstances, Perhaps a Machiavellian prince was what the newly independent Sweden needed. For at the end of his reign, Sweden was both more stable and powerful than when he had entered office. Through his reign, Sweden had finally stepped out of the Middle Ages and the Swedish Empire lay on the horizon. Today, I hope you learned something new about King Gustav Vasa as well as about Swedish history. Thanks for watching.